like Bitcoin is a mirror. Uh, and I like posing it like that. Bitcoin is us holding up a mirror to the way the world works. And it sort of unbiasedly and unabashedly showing back to us what's going on. And the problem is that uh, there are no other mirrors quite like it in society. And so it's very easy to blame the mirror. All right, Brandon, thank you for joining me today. Great to be here, Artie. So you're the chief of staff of the CEO of uh, BTC Inc. Uh, you are the head of basically the Bitcoin conference, the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. And my understanding is you're also on the board of advisors of the University of Alabama. Is there anything outside of that that you'd want listeners who might not be familiar with you to know about you? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, uh, those are sort of, I guess, some, some key things that I'm, I'm working on these days. Uh, you know, I also do a little investing in the, the Bitcoin space, uh, invest into a few different projects and companies. And, uh, yeah, you know, I would say my passion is just, uh, working on interesting, hard problems. And, uh, you know, it may not seem like it, but, uh, coordinating a Bitcoin conference is, certainly the hardest problem I've ever uh, worked on in my life. Uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I would say scheduling, as far as running a podcast, scheduling is one of my most difficult things. And it's a little bit different than the conference because everything's in that shorter time period. But still dealing with people's schedules, especially busy people. And you had some very busy people at the, uh, at the conference this year. How do you no, manage totally. that? How do you uh, well, work with everyone's so, schedules? Yeah, in, in 2021, I was uh, focused on programming for the conference. So that was the event that obviously uh, we had Bukele announce legal tender for El Salvador for Bitcoin. And uh, and so I, I got my hand at like truly trying to program a full conference. And it, it's it's the hardest job, I think, in, in the whole industry. I mean, uh, uh, you kind of have... There's, there's a few things you have to kind of deal with. On the first hand... Uh, you want to shoot big and get really big name speakers to, to agree to come. And you're selling them on a vision of, you know, what the conference is going to be. And it's one of those, like I tell my team all the time, it's like you're throwing a party. And the way that you throw a party is like, well, so and so is going to be there. So you have to come. Uh, and then, you know, you're kind of like social engineering, you know, like I know this guy who's really good friends with her and, and she's, you know, reports directly to him. And, and then we, you know, and then we can bridge over to this person because uh, uh, they're going to see each other in a week kind of thing. It's like, it's truly like that level of planning of, of how we get some of the people there. And so, you know, we had in 2021, uh, we had three stages that I was planning um, and a total of around, let's say, 300 speakers. And, and so I really got to, uh, do that full on by myself. We now have a programming team, uh, that, but they're, they're programming seven stages. Uh, you know, we had seven stages at Bitcoin 2024. So, uh, we had roughly a 450 speakers, each with their own schedule, their own, uh, you know, everyone's going to the Bitcoin conference to, to get things done. And so, you know, the speaking slot has to coincide with every meeting they're taking and, and every, uh, uh, you know, other travel consideration they have. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And then you have to manage the egos. Like, who yeah. am I on stage with? Is this person of my caliber? What are we going to be talking about? Does this fit with my business goals of being at the conference? Uh, you know, why don't I get a keynote when this person gets a keynote? I mean, it, it's a mess. Uh, so, so it's, it's a very big puzzle. Uh, and it takes a lot of patience and a special kind of person to be able to solve it. We got a really great team working on it. With that ego issue, I mean, do you have people drop out and say, I don't want to do it if I don't get this and this? 100%. Hmm. A handful of people every event uh, yeah. who you just you can't accommodate like what their exact need is. And, you know, they'll just say, screw it. Uh, so uh, it's it's the worst part of it. And, and it reflects, I think it reflects poorly on like the, the people who choose to do that. But, uh, it's just kind of a reality of the job. Like some people are very particular with how they're positioned and, uh, how they, uh, uh, want to be seen in the public stage. And, you know, if you can't accommodate them, you lose them. And that's just the, it, it sucks, but that's the reality. Yeah. So you got the first, uh, 
former U.S. president to ever speak at a Bitcoin conference uh, with Trump joining this year. I'm I'm curious, did you have that same proposal to, uh, was Joe Biden still the nominee at that time? Uh, did you reach yeah. out to his campaign and get anything? Oh, yeah. No, we uh, we were talking with the, the Biden campaign for months as well. Uh, you know, it was it was strange. And upon sort of talking to other people who have tried similar things with him, it doesn't seem like we were unique in some of our challenges. Uh, in hindsight, it's obvious, right, uh, based on kind of what happened with him in his campaign. But he wasn't making any public appearances that weren't tightly controlled, highly scripted, and, uh, you know, usually within uh, an easy travel experience to the White House or to Delaware, right? And so, uh, uh, of course, we didn't know that at the time. And so we got these just confoundingly frustrating, vague, like, we'll circle back, we're discussing this, you know, like, uh, and we never really could figure out, like, what was the hesitation? I mean, we were offering a massive stage to a huge audience of people that uh, care very much about who's going to be president and that, what that president's view is of this emerging technology of Bitcoin. And, you know, like we're offering up his chance to like speak directly to them with basically no strings attached, like just come use the platform and campaign to these people. And, you know, like <laughs> that's all yeah. we're asking here. And yeah. obviously, you know, Trump thought it was great. RFK thought it was great. Uh, but, you know, both Biden and, and Kamala, uh, when we were talking to her as well, like couldn't um, couldn't get them to kind of uh, seal the deal. So you were reaching out to Kamala, too? We talked to, to both of their campaigns uh, very extensively. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, like, what what do you think the hang up was? Just you think it was just that they wanted to be more scripted with it or i mean they could be too though right if it if they're coming to speak they trump's was fairly i mean i'm sure trump's is scripted when he goes up there he's not doing a trump has a script we'll put it that way you know yeah. uh, uh he, he's his own man like he says what he, what he thinks in the moment but uh yeah like you know they they can absolutely control uh uh wide, wide swaths of it i think what you're asking is an interesting question. Like, you know, why did they choose to, uh, to not utilize the platform? Um, and I think that there are uh, multiple answers to it and each one has its own validity. And I don't know if anyone truly knows the answer. You know, there are political considerations. Maybe there's, uh, people in, in Biden and Harris's orbit who hate Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I, some of the policy decisions they've made over the past three and a half years certainly suggests that that could be the case. I think that, you know, maybe they just saw this as an issue that wasn't a priority that they didn't understand sort of the value of connecting with this audience or, you know, maybe I have to think it was kind of funny. The, the Saturday before our event was the Saturday that Biden dropped out of the race mm -hmm. and Kamala took over as the candidate and so there was also this chaotic sort of yeah. maybe it just the the timing was there's too much going on. But that being said, you know the people that we talked to, especially on the the Harris side, uh, didn't make it seem like that was an issue. And so you, you know, and, and maybe I sound partisan on this. I, I'm truly not, but my read is that I think that they just don't like Bitcoin. Like I think that they they don't want to be pro Bitcoin in their stance. And, and I think they have their reasons for it. You know, I could speculate on what they are, but I think it ranges everywhere from the worn wing of the party to, uh, you know, different national security people or, uh, uh, you know, treasury people who, uh, take really dim views on Bitcoin and the way that, uh, it affects U.S. monetary policy or, or geopolitical considerations. I think they're wrong. You know, like, I think there's actually really strong, strong reasons why Bitcoin from a geopolitical national security sense is actually incredibly important. Um, but that being said, you know, if they don't have those people in their orbit making that case and explaining it, then, you know, they can take a very myopic view of, of the opportunity of Bitcoin and, and why it's so important. With the one of the reasons 
I find it kind of interesting that they opted not to go is in the last few months since the conference, Harris's campaign has shifted its stance on crypto as far as their public stance to be at least appearing more favorable to it or open to it. So it is interesting that they didn't take that chance to make it more obvious if they really wanted to bring Bitcoin people into their camp, that that was like probably the best opportunity for them to do it, period. Yeah, well, and and what's interesting is I don't consider myself to be like that politically savvy, uh, but having, you know, I've dealt with senators now for four years at the conference and, and, you know, now presidential candidates, like I get a good sense of how these people think and, and what the considerations are. I actually take the exact opposite view where, uh, in some ways, I think that the Kamala campaign are, are almost telegraphing the fact that they're going to be status quo on, uh, the issue of, of Bitcoin and crypto in the United States. And, uh, if any, you know, status quo at best. And the reason why is there, there have been these moments where they tried to put something together. I remember they had a round table with, you know, industry executives that was on a Zoom. A lot of people were able to join. No one of importance from the Kamala side actually showed up for that. It was mostly people who wanted to see Kamala as a pro crypto person, uh, uh, who were donors or, or, you know, influential towards her. Those were the people that showed up, but mm. Kamala didn't show up. Kamala has never shown up in any sort of capacity where, you know, she could do anything at all. Like even the smallest consideration of her, like putting a put, uh, foot forward saying like, I think that there's some good to this crypto thing, like nothing. Mm. The, the best we've gotten was a quote, I think yesterday, maybe where she said, uh, digital assets and AI are important innovations or something like that. You know, like that's the most positive like stance we've gotten directly from Kamala. I don't know if she said that out loud or if that was, you know, a written reply to something Uh, like it's, it's really hard to pin down what she's thinking, but she has all of the opportunity in the world to be very pro or to uh, quell a lot of the concerns that the industry has towards her. And she's done nothing to quell it. And in my mind, that is the signal. You know, it's like you can, you can give someone the opportunity 10 times to prove that they're not negative. And if they just don't take the opportunity in earnest, then you have to assume that they're negative. And, you know, I think it's foolish to assume otherwise at this point. Is it kind of surprising, like where things stand with crypto with? Republicans or the right being more open to it right now and Democrats and being less open to it because conservative is usually associated with status quo. Liberal is more open to just new possibilities. And these are very big generalizations, obviously. But Mm -hmm. with those generalizations, does that surprise you where we're sitting right now with where it stands? You know, it's Again, a really good question. Uh, I would take a, uh, I don't know if cynical is the right word, but uh, uh, I would take a view on this that our parties are less right and left now, and they're much more up and down. And up is kind of a trend towards authoritarian and centralization, and down is towards decentralization. And, uh, you know, meritocracy, I would say. And, and so the, uh, like, obviously it shows where, where kind of my thoughts are at this point from a political standpoint. I have never voted for a Republican in my life, you know, hand to God. So this, this would be a very strange departure for me to, to find myself where I am politically. But that's just the, the, I think the reality of how the political environment has shaped over the past four years. Like, I am very scared of of the trend of how the Democrats sort of view um, new policy initiatives and new technologies and uh, what I would call like creative destruction, right? This idea that uh, uh, old things have to go away for new things to to take their place. 
And we, there's like so many entrenched ish, uh, interests in those old things that we have to prevent the new things from washing them away. And the only way we can do that is to tighten control of the, the situation. And, uh, you know, you can call it regulatory capture. You can call it all these different things, but, uh, you know, the, the simplistically put way of describing it is kind of that. And, and so that is the, Sclerosis of sort of society that I think leads to our downfall. And so, you know, whereas this sort of Trumpian model is, uh, I wouldn't call it conservative, you know, uh, I would call it, um, I ironically very much bent to the whims of one individual. And so there is this like sort of centralized piece to it, which is, yeah. uh, a little bit confounding, but, uh, at the same time, it's this centralized piece that moves fast and breaks things. And, and so, it, it, like, he brings almost this innovator's uh, spirit towards a lot of these problems that then creates the space for industry and the market to, to move in and start, you know, charting a new path. So, I don't know, man. Like, it's, it's a very strange political environment. And uh, uh, I just, I feel like, People who find themselves on the other side of where I, I find myself, I don't think have fully like woken up to the the reality of where they're at because I just don't believe that there's that many people in the U.S. Like certainly there are people at this point who are very pro communism. Like you know there was a march in Philadelphia just yesterday of like the Communist Party. Like these people exist, but I think that the there are few and far between in the United States, and and most people don't wouldn't want to ally with that if they realize that's kind of the direction it's heading. Yeah, I, I agree with you with the authoritarian libertarian um, aspect of it. Uh, a test that people can take is the political compass and uh, test and that puts you right, left and libertarian uh, authoritarian. And I'm very anti-authoritarian myself. Uh, I don't really care what people do if they're adults, just, you know, I, I live and let live for the most part. And I'm against authoritarianism, whether it's on the right or the left. I mean, it, it manifests in slightly different ways, but it's, it's horrible no matter what. So mm -hmm. I very much agree with that. Um, with the, well, and, and a quick note on that, just super yeah. quick is, uh, the libertarian convention that happened this year, two presidential candidates showed up. It was RFK yeah. and Trump. And, you know, it's not surprising that they find themselves on the same side of the ticket now, but, but keep going. Well, I mean, the Libertarian Party specifically, I wish they could capture on that libertarian word a bit better because, I mean, I think most people in America, America is basically a libertarian country for the most part, but they seem to have trouble capturing that. And obviously there's a bunch of corruption with the parties, uh, making sure that third parties don't get in there, all that kind of stuff. So you mentioned, you know, there is some support for communism and well, it is a small amount. I, I think it's still concerning to to have there because, like the Bolsheviks in in Russia, they were a fraction of the left. They were like a tiny fraction of it, and they ended up getting control. So, mm -hmm. un unfortunately, in really in like revolutionary times, a small portion of people can make a, can find themselves in power, and I'd, I'd hate to see authoritarianism lead the way more than it already well, and, and you know to to uh drive home that point at least from my perspective and there may be people who disagree with me on this and i totally respect that but uh you know my viewpoint on um sort of the the democratic party as it relates to israel palestine i think crystallizes this and uh you know a lot of people don't talk about like the palestinian culture and the palestinian form of government is a Marxist uh, government. And, and, you know, that's part of the reason why Palestinians have had issues in the region with every country they've been in, and they ultimately get kicked out, is that they are Marxist revolutionaries who have tried to overthrow the leader of the country they were in, and then they got kicked out. And, you know, they eventually found themselves uh, uh, coalescing in, in Palestine. And uh, uh, it's the Israel Palestine issue that I think is going to be the cornerstone stone issue of the Democratic Party and where they ultimately land. And, um, 
And, you know, I, I think that Kamala in a lot of ways is, is hostage to, uh, the sort of far left that allies very closely with the Palestinians. It's not that, you know, some people may find themselves on one side or the other, but there's like a spectrum of support. And, uh, it's the furthest support towards like, you know, I think Hamas is doing a great job type people that like ultimately need to show up at the polls in order for Kamala to have a chance to win, uh, the election. And I think that that is going to allow them to have like very strong say over obviously the geopolitical issue of Israel, Palestine, but that will extend, you know, like these, these people, once they are able to kind of bully on an issue, uh, will be seen as like power brokers for the party. And all of a sudden their influence, uh, extends beyond just this one issue. So uh, it's, it's just another data point that, that I find to be very salient, you know, in the way that I look at the equation right now and, uh, uh, pretty worrying in terms of the trend of the party. And that's not to say like, you know, you have to view that issue one way or the other, but it's the, the mechanism by which people are viewing that issue on the left, that there is this sort of like, uh, oppressor, oppressee, who's the oppressor, who's the oppressee, who is the power group, who is the group without power. Like it ultimately frames it up as a very Marxist standpoint. Uh, and, and it's like, you know, if the oppressor is bad and the oppressed is good, then all the rest of the details don't really matter. The oppressor is in the wrong. The oppressed is in the right. And, and it, again, it's not to say that uh, uh, the Palestinian element isn't sympathetic or there's no reason to support them. But it is to say that if that is the framework by which you are arriving at that conclusion, then uh, that is a Marxist framework that is permeating the way by which we're viewing this problem. And, and that has major implications. Um, and you see it in other social issues that have existed in the U S over the past few years. You know, you saw it in the black lives matter, you know, stuff you saw it in, uh, um, like a handful of other uh, examples. And so, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's something to keep track of in my mind. It'd be interesting. Well, first of all, I want to, with the Palestine stuff, do you th- is that Hamas push- pushing the Marxist ideology or is it just within the culture in general? I'm, I'm, I'm not too familiar. So I'm, I'm just asking. It's both. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you Googled right now, like what is the political, uh, alignment of Hamas, whether it would outright say like Hamas is a communist, uh, form of, go- you know, governmental party. I'm not sure if, you know, that's, easily understood. But in these other countries where uh, uh, Palestinians tried to overthrow the ruler, I think in Jordan, maybe Lebanon, uh, both those countries, they, they had an uprising of Palestinians to overthrow their leader and instill a communist government. Like that was their, their goal. Uh, and that's why they got kicked out. So, uh, uh, you, you know, Hamas is their current form of government. And so by extension, you know, I think it's a safe assumption that they're at the very least communist Marxist elements, if not outright stated that they are a communist government. Interesting. You, you raise a good point with the oppressor, that, that kind of narrative with the oppressor, oppressy stuff, it gets pushed constantly. And I, I've said it numerous times, like the biggest oppressor, in my opinion, is usually a government. Like no one is in a position to oppress people more than any government out there. Any people are being oppressed by their government more than the other people in that society. But the oppressor, at least in the U.S., it's all about other people being the oppressor. It's usually not the government. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I, I would generally agree. But I think, again, it, it goes back to what what is the form of government that kind of exists on in the skeleton of those interactions. And when you have a authoritarian form of government, and maybe that's a better way of kind of saying it is like, you know, it's, it's less about, you know, do they follow the principle of Karl Marx? It's more about, you know, do they believe that the government should have the power to make kind of all the decisions? Um, and, and they're kind of therefore be the primary agent in, the aspects of economy and social, you know, consensus and like all these kinds of things, uh, that, you know, it, it's hard to then remove them from some of those interactions of people to people. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's a common tactic throughout history of just pitting people against each other to solidify power for any government or anybody trying to gain power. They they say, these people are trying to do this and this and this to you. And that and that seems to be more and more of the rhetoric in the U.S. And, and worldwide, we're seeing it more and more. It just, it's unfortunate because I, I think more people should be against the government rather than other people because I, I think most people get along fairly well. I mean, there's differences, of course, but I think the government is usually the bigger problem than other people for the most part. Yeah. How do you, uh, how'd you get into Bitcoin initially? You know, uh, it, it's actually very orthogonal. I uh, was at the University of Alabama. Um, I was in a program called the Fellows Program there. And I uh, was graduating. And this guy, David Bailey, came down to campus who had been in the program I was in like uh, four years earlier. So I'd never met him, but I had, I had heard of him kind of through this program. And uh, he did this fireside talk with a guy from the New York Times. And this was in 2016 or, 20, or early 2017. So like Trump had just won the election. And, you know, it, it, a lot, again, I was a very liberal person at the time. Like all of my sensibilities and understanding of, of the world got flipped on its head. Like I didn't think it was possible that this Trump guy could be elected. And all of a sudden he's elected. And I go to sit down and listen to this fireside chat on like, the future of truth or something like that. You know, what is truth? And here was this guy running an upstart media company. And here was a guy from the New York Times. And I was excited to listen to this guy from the New York Times just absolutely roast this David Bailey character and, uh, you know, uh, just pin him down and, and show him everything. And instead, I watched this David guy basically dismantle uh, uh, the New York Times reporter. And, and he basically talked about, you know, what you see going on in the world today is not an aberration. It's a trend. Information is being decentralized. The internet has decentralized information and put it in the power of the people. You don't need these massive institutions that exist uh, to continue to exist in the same form that they do. And the New York Times got everything wrong. They were wrong about Trump Hillary. They were wrong about who's going to win the election. They were wrong about all these major issues. You know, they were wrong about uh, Iraq uh, war, they, like all of these different moments where, you know, people relied on them and they were wrong. And at some point they, they lose the trust of the people and they pave the way for these outside media folks to come in and, and eat their lunch. And, uh, and then he was like, and get this, uh, what the internet, has done to information, Bitcoin will do to money. Hmm. And I was like, well, okay, you know, what's this guy talking about? You know, and so I talked to him afterwards and I I was like, I got a free summer. You know, I started a job in September. I was going to work in Anheuser-Busch. I was a chemical engineering background. I was going to brew beer, right? Uh, Anheuser-Busch. And, but I had this free summer. I was like, I live in Nashville. Uh, I'm, you know, I was, I'm born and raised in Nashville and uh, y'all are based in Nashville. Can, can I come like intern and learn from you for a summer? And he said, sure. Uh, and so I literally got my start moving boxes at this Bitcoin media company, moving boxes of magazines in the storage closet and like shipping them out to people who purchased them. And I knew nothing about Bitcoin, nothing about media, nothing about anything. Uh, and I just learned from there. Yeah. So, so, uh, I really just learned from, from that internship. And, uh, it's been, you know, uh, seven and a half years now working in the industry and, continuing to learn about Bitcoin and, and media for that matter and uh, how to build a successful Bitcoin media company. Yeah, the media thing is really interesting because, you know, we've we've had these legacy media companies and they were the sources of truth for decades. And, and, and we kind of just took it for granted that this is where you get your news from. And now we have the decentralization. I'm part of that. And, you know, I'm I don't consider myself news or anything, but I'm having conversations with people and, and exploring different avenues of information. And it's really interesting to see how it's all unfolding. And you see these legacy media. I don't even understand. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. Like, why is it, is it just that they've, they've seen themselves as the authority that they kind of stop questioning themselves? Like, 
why is that that there's such a lack of truth? I mean, a lot of legacy media can be called propaganda, rightly so, at this point. And I mean, you get better information from often from podcasts and small news outlets and things like that. What do you think, in your opinion, happened to these legacy media outlets? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I think that there are so many narratives that could be spun of exactly what happened. Uh, but I'll give, I'll offer up one. Uh, and, and I think that this is part of the truth, but I don't, I don't say, I don't, I don't pretend like this is the encompassing reason that all of this happened. But I think what, what happened is in the early 2000s, when the internet disrupted, uh, you know, the sharing of information, it upended the, uh, the economic models of media organizations. And what that meant is that there was not massive money in going into journalism anymore. You know, you would still have the few highly respected, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, Brian Williams, this is like almost a, a punchline of highly respected, but like, you know, the, the famous, anchors and, and journalists that everyone, you know, knows. Um, but chances are, you're not going to get to that point. And chances are, you're going to like work a very low salary uh, to kind of grind in the, you know, the war room and, and turn in, you know, your pieces multiple times a week. Right. And, and so it's like, well, who does that uh, select for? Yeah. And, it doesn't select for the highly ambitious earner who's highly qualified and capable and brilliant and can, you know, write their ticket anywhere. They're not going to just go into journalism. There's no money in it. There's no upward mobility in it unless, you know, you just happen to be selected for one of those pristine spots. And so who it does select for are the two people. It's, it's the activists. It's the people who view the power of the pen as a way to push an important truth that they see in the world uh, and an important agenda. And then it's the people who uh, see the power structures that are enabled by these uh, media engines and want to leverage that for some personal mobility elsewhere, right? And, and so... Uh, what that means is that, and you saw this happen in real time in the past like two decades, especially, is you had a hollowing out of the bipartisan nature of editorial rooms. And almost all mainstream editorial rooms now are highly liberal. And, uh, the thing is, is when you have, you know, an indistinguishable New York Times, Washington Post, uh, uh, Vox, Vice, uh, I mean, you name it, ABC, NBC, CNN, all of them have effectively the same editorial policy of like, we like the guys on the left. Then the only way that you can distinguish yourself is by having the most access to the power brokers of the left, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, who's going to be the trusted source? Who's going to be, you know, the, the confidant of those trusted sources? Who's going to push the agenda for them? And it became this competition of like, who's going to be the biggest lapdog to Pelosi, Schumer, Obama, Biden, et cetera. And uh, like, who can spew the, the narrative the best because I'm going to get the next story from them tomorrow. Uh, and so it very much became this like alignment, hyper alignment with, uh, uh, the left to publish the propaganda, like you said. Uh, uh, and it's being published by a group of people top to bottom, you know, from the editorial editor in chief all the way to the, you know, 20 K annual salary journalists in the war room. They all agree with what they're putting out. You know, it's, it's the ideology that they're brought up in. And so there's like no, uh, tripwire. There's no flashpoint. There's no moment where it's like, we've gone too far. Uh, it's like, no, we're actually just continuing to do what I believe is right. And therefore, like you end up in this end state where they truly are propaganda mouthpieces of a party. And, uh, and there is no business in reporting the truth in that standpoint. You know, like what's the upside in reporting the truth? 
all you'll do is you'll burn your source, you'll burn your relationship, and they'll go to the next guy uh, to start using the mouthpiece. So that's that's my narrative of what I think has happened, but I know that that's just a small piece of it. Yeah, I think the 24-hour news cycle had a little bit to do with it, too. Um, they have to keep pumping out news, quote, news. And I've noticed, I I don't think I, I rarely see any news piece that doesn't have opinion in it. Like, yeah, almost never. Like, all all news is just, a lot of it is just commentary. And that's what you see when you... If you turn on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, all of it, you might see like one or two percent of like informational news on there, but then the rest is just commentary talking about it, you know, talking about the news, giving your opinion about it. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's it's a really great point, too. And, and, you know, I would say like Twitter, for instance, did a lot of like, you know, you want to know what the news is and what the facts are. Go follow at AP on Twitter. They'll dash it out in, in a sentence. And, uh, you know, that leaves very little, like they'll get it out quicker than the newsroom could by an hour, you know, or 30 minutes at least. Right. So, uh, it, it took away that breaking news element to it. The, you know, another, another piece of this, right. Is you have like, let's, let's take Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow, right. Uh, the two sort of highest performing journalists on the left and the right, both, I think, pedal in uh, falsities and misinformation to a large extent. Like, I hate the word misinformation. You know, at this point, it's like, you know, it's a bastardized meaning of its own word. Yeah. But what these people were doing is they were effectively like crafting a narrative for the world around you that made internally consistent sense. Yeah. But because neither narrative was rooted in fact and, and unbiased, then at some point, it became more important to keep the narrative internally consistent than it did to keep the narrative grounded in truth. And, uh, and so, you know, like a great example of this was Rachel Maddow with Trump and the uh, Russiagate, you know, for two years, every night you turned on Rachel Maddow for her to explain how Trump was about to be you know, thrown in jail for colluding yeah. with the Russians. And here's one more piece of information that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Trump colluded with the Russians this whole time, you know? And that's the reason why he won the election. And it's like, you know, the reason why she did that was because the Democrats refused to concede the fact that they just fucking lost the election. Like, yeah. they just lost. And, and because that goes outside of their narrative, which is like, we are the people everyone's a Democrat, you know, like these Republicans, they're these deplorable fringe folks on the other side that, you know, like you may see them walking around your neighborhood, but you don't really know who they are. You know, it's like, uh, uh, they, they had to do it. Otherwise they had this massive egg on their face. And so they just kept doubling down, doubling down, doubling down. And these, these worldviews just diverged drastically. And, and I, I think that, that, you know, a hundred percent to your point is like a, another huge element of what's gone on. Yeah. And I feel lucky. I, I mean, I feel like anyone who has friends and knows people on all over the political spectrum, they're lucky enough to see a more accurate representation of the world than the news and all of that commentary is giving people because I didn't like Trump in 2016. I, I didn't vote for Hillary. I voted for Jill Stein. So I was very liberal at the time. And I remember looking around, you know, and hearing the the stuff in the news about how, you know, Trump supporters are racist and stuff like that. But luckily I knew some Trump supporters and I was like, these are good people. Like the people I know that are supporting Trump aren't bad people. I don't agree with them, but they're not whatever is being talked about in the news. Like I know those mm-hmm. more extreme types exist, of course, but I think it's overplayed and you see it on both sides of course you see the rhetoric uh not a line up with reality quite often so totally it's really interesting with with trump he's changed his uh views on crypto significantly since 2016 or however far you want to go back uh, mm-hmm. I, I think he called it a I, I don't know i don't want to say the wrong word but he he essentially called it a scam or not yeah. important in 2016. 
Um, does this change in how he feels? Like, do you see it as more pragmatic or do you think it's just a play on uh, appealing to voters? You know, uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I've answered this a couple of times. And so, you know, uh, apologies if the answer sounds a little like too polished, but this is, this is what I actually believe which is that Trump is like, we talked about this earlier, like he's an entrepreneur. He takes this sort of like uh, move fast, break things, uh, uh, clear the path, let the market come in and, and uh, you know, clean it up. And, um, and I think that Trump saw like it, that sort of mindset, like requires you to see opportunities and, and execute against them. And I think Trump saw the opportunity of being pro Bitcoin and uh, and he, you know, jumped on it. And so there is this element of like pragmatism that certainly played a part. But what I will also say, it really, like there's kind of two things to note. Number one is that every Bitcoiner today, I believe, started as a skeptic and probably called it a scam when they first found out about it. And, you know, he was the president at the time. You know, I, I can't fault him for not looking more closely at it. He, he had a lot of stuff on his plate. Yeah, like you know, I, so I, I don't fault him for calling it a scam. Michael Saylor, the first tweet you can find about him calling uh, talking about Bitcoin was 2013, 2014. He called it a scam. You know, now he's the biggest Bitcoin proponent in the, the public markets, and so uh, I don't hold that against him by any stretch. And what I'll say is, like in this pragmatic flip. Uh, we've had a lot of active conversations with him and, and he does get it now. And, and it's not just like he's saying, you know, to quote Sam Bankman Fried, saying the shibboleths, right? Like, uh, uh, that he's actually kind of going down the rabbit hole, which is really cool to see. So, uh, I would say I would categorize it as he saw the opportunity, but then he is putting in the work in order to like truly understand what this is that he's like helping protect in the U S and so I'm very bullish on the, the whole situation. Yeah. What was FTX to you? Like what, what happened? Like what's, I, I know we, we all know the surface story, but there's a lot of details that don't get talked about too much. And I mean, FTX was a major or Sam Bankman fried was a major donor to the Democrats. I think right under Soros, um, mm -hmm. in 20, was that 2022? 22. Um, he was a major donor. Uh, I've heard a lot of allegations of, of money laundering and things like that. Uh, from your perspective, what do you think was actually going on there? I think that, uh, you know, like I, I, there's been, there's been distance from it to where like some of my emotional reaction you know, I know I'm not speaking out of just like an emotional, like, oh my God, this guy just screwed our entire industry over, uh, which was my reaction at the time. I mean, like seething hatred towards this guy. Uh, so I, I like, I hedge with that statement, but I still think ultimately what this was, this was just a massive scam. This was just a Ponzi and it traces back to uh, Alameda before FTX even launched Alameda, you know, the record show was an insolvent hedge fund. And, uh, that was still returning capital at crazy, uh, you know, monthly APR or yearly APR that they were, they were touting. And so all that FTX ever was, was a very sophisticated way to pump more money into the Ponzi. And the, cruel irony of it is that in the process, they built a phenomenal product that FTX exchange was the best exchange in the industry. Mm. And so, you know, like they, they almost scammed their way into a legitimate business. Um, and then, you know, like Solana now has emerged as like maybe the number two blockchain behind Bitcoin, you know, in some people's minds. And, like all, he, I think he was a seed investor in Anthropic, which is like arguably maybe the second most valuable AI company. And so it's like there's all of these things where if he had been able to hang on for another year, he may have actually just scammed his way out of the Ponzi and and like created a solvent company. 
But like, thank God he didn't, you know, uh, for all the carnage and for all the pain and, and suffering that it brought our industry and people who had their money on FTX and, uh, uh all of the fallout, all of the other companies that went under because FTX went under for all of like, if he, if he had been able to perpetuate it, it would have been that much bigger when it all came crashing down in the future. Because the the thing is, is like, you know, there's this element, maybe he would have scammed his way out of the Ponzi. Maybe he would have had the solvency in order to, you know, continue it. But he was still a scammer willing to commingle funds, willing to promise returns that he couldn't back up with performance. And, uh, and so all that would have happened is that we were 10 X the amount of money in it. And he still would have committed the same behaviors that ultimately led to the same downfall. It just would have been that much more chaotic and that much more painful. So it's this mixed bag of, of just, you know, reflection and, uh, I mean, dude, he spoke at the conference in 2021. Like, uh, I met him. I, I, I talked to him on multiple interview shows. Like we used to run this drinks and quarantine back in 2020. He invited me out to Hong Kong. He was like, whenever this pandemic's over, you get, you should come hang out. Like I thought I knew the guy and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it shakes you a little bit yourself when, you know, you think you have good judgment. You think you can judge character well. You think you know what's going on. And you have a, a literal scammer just like playing you like a fiddle. So, you know, it's yeah. it's a black eye a little bit on, you know, at least that I give myself personally for, for giving him the time of day and, and talking to him and thinking of him as a, a smart guy. So, I don't know. It's it's Obviously, it's still a sore subject for me. Yeah. I, I really, I, it's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, did you guys talk technical stuff? Because I, I'm sure he is smart in some respects, but I remember seeing some clips of him talking about crypto, and it's like, what the hell is he even? He's talking about things going into a box, and you don't know what it's going on, and then it comes out of the box, and it, it just made no sense. What? And I'm probably not relaying that properly, but what he was yeah, saying no. didn't make any sense. Sometimes what he said didn't make any sense. And then sometimes you would see him build engines that were like the, the I mean, it, it's hard to square the fact that he was the CEO of FTX and they created the single greatest exchange in our industry. And that like, he had no clue what he was saying at all at any given time. Like he knew what he was talking about. That being said, I think his ideas were wrong. There's that, you know, when he spoke at the conference in 2021, uh, I'll encourage anyone listening to this to go back and listen to that panel because ultimately, uh, uh, he went head to head with someone, Caitlin Long, who is a very respected person in the Bitcoin space and she focuses on Bitcoin. She doesn't care about, you know, the rest of crypto. And they went back and forth on this idea because, uh, uh, Sam was all about like, you know, these futures and the leverage that you can get in FTX. There's like, there's a place for it in the industry and, and it's a healthy element to add. And Caitlin was saying, no, actually like all leverage is bad. It creates circulation credit and it's ultimately going to collapse on itself because of Bitcoin's ability to settle within 10 minutes, uh, on chain. And, and you'll, you'll always have this element where if you have too much leverage in the system, one transaction on chain can bring it all down, you know, like uh, one person withdrawing from the exchange on, on chain. Uh, can suck the liquidity out and collapse the entire market. And sure enough, that was ultimately sort of the, the way by which FTX failed. You know, it would fail because it was a, a Ponzi, but it, the mechanism by which it collapsed was all of this leverage, uh, uh, trading on FTT token that they were using as like their basically their treasury. And, and, yeah. you know, FTT collapsed. There was this cascading liquidation. And then, you know, it's game over. And so she was right. And, you know, the, the right idea was posed on stage next to his bad idea. But I still regret, you know, giving him the stage to, to say the bad ideas uh, out loud. Yeah. With, uh, I mean, you called FTX a Ponzi scheme, which it was. Some people, and I believe it's a naive criticism, but people who are against Bitcoin and against crypto will call Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme. Uh, does it get frustrating to have actual Ponzi schemes in the crypto space? 
And then you're you're trying to defend Bitcoin as not being a Ponzi scheme, but then there's these Ponzi schemes that actually do happen around it. Yeah, it's it's maddening. Uh, the you know the the reality is is like a Ponzi scheme is uh, is a pyramid scheme with someone taking the money out the top, right? Yeah. And the reality is is pyramid schemes are the the foundation of society like i know that's a really weird spicy take but uh uh, the entire structure of society is pyramid you know Mm -hmm. like there are more people on the base you have fewer the higher up the ladder you go the fewer the people are and that exists in you know societal structures it exists in corporate structures it exists in the way that money is distributed it exists in everything and so you could look at the u.s dollar and you could say, well, the U.S. dollar is a pyramid scheme. You could probably make the argument the U.S. dollar is actually a Ponzi scheme because you have, you know, literally a guy at the top who can uh, pull money out of the system and, and add it to the system at will. Like, you know, that is actually very much structured as a Ponzi scheme. It's yeah. just a Ponzi scheme we're all required to buy into. Whereas, you know, Bitcoin, there is no person who can control the supply, who can make changes to it. There's no one person who is directly benefited by you buying into his Ponzi, you know, like, so, so there's a, there's a clear distinction and it's the most important distinction to make, which is like, you're not directly benefiting some creator of this scheme. Uh, uh, the only people participating in it are people who are participating in the same capacity that you are. And so by that way, it's like very meritocratic and egalitarian. It's just that ultimately the same pyramidal structure forms naturally in the way that Bitcoin is distributed, just like in the way that every other asset is distributed, just like every other society is built. So mm-hmm. like that's the the frustrating sort of thing where it's like, you know, I, I say this all the time, like internally at the company, but it, I, like Bitcoin is a mirror. Uh, and I like posing it like that. Bitcoin is us holding up a mirror to the way the world works and it's sort of unbiasedly and unabashedly showing back to us what's going on. And the problem is that uh, there are no other mirrors quite like it in society. And so it's very easy to blame the mirror uh, on what's going on. And in reality, it's, it's just honest truth. Like it's just a tool that's showing us that what's going on, you know, through its price, through its on, uh, on-chain usage, through, you know, all these different metrics. And, uh, people imbue a lot more meaning into it, uh, and try and criticize it by what it's telling you. And, uh, I think you just got to listen to what it's saying. Uh, to go back just a little bit, you, your origin story with Bitcoin is interesting because it it almost has nothing to do with Bitcoin. You're dealing with truth in that conversation. And then, you know, you're, you're dealing with moving boxes of the magazine and stuff like that. Where did the actual where did your actual support for Bitcoin start? Like, when did you make that realization of, oh, this is something I'm actually interested in? Did you go read the white paper? Was that kind of it? Yeah, you know, I, uh, to be frank, I don't know if I've ever actually, I'm sure I've read the white paper like all the way through, but like, I don't know if you've ever read a white paper. Like, it's pretty boring stuff, you know? <laughs> like, uh, uh, I was lucky that I worked at Bitcoin magazine, like the Bitcoin company, you know, like uh, uh, I got to learn from some of the smartest people in the entire space. And, and that's what, like I I say, I keep learning, you know, like uh, it doesn't, it doesn't end. I can't say that there was like a defining moment where I went from like, I don't understand Bitcoin to, I understand Bitcoin. I think every day I understand a little bit better. And so you know, could I tell you that there's this moment in time where the flip, the switch flipped and, and I went from kind of not caring to caring? I don't think so. Like, I, I think that it was just, it's, it's been a continual gradual process. But what I will say is that it's only gone one way. Like there has not been a day where I was looking at everything going on in the space and I was like, eh, maybe this isn't that important. You know, like, uh, uh, Every day, my conviction in what Bitcoin can do for humanity, what Bitcoin can do for the world, uh, strengthens. And, uh, uh, you know, 
my, I guess, bullishness on, on the future of it, it, it just increases. So that, that would be my, my hedge to it. Yeah, you're very bullish on the uh, on the price. I remember I, I listened to another interview you did, and it was it might have been a year old, but you were making some predictions for 2025, and I think your prices were like your high end was like 1.5 million, and your I don't remember what your low end low end was, but I think your base was like 350 like that was your base uh prediction like do you still is that still where you kind of stand with that yeah no I, I would say so and uh there's so we're in an interesting point right now for for bitcoin price and, and bitcoin adoption yeah i'm a big believer in sort of the four-year cycles and so this year was actually supposed to be the halving year hmm. which is like just the very beginnings of the bull market, usually, yeah. you know, if you just look back at like the four year cycle, maybe by December, you start seeing like some real upward price movement. And instead, uh, you know, three months before the halving, four months before the halving, we hit all time highs. And so yeah. already there's been like this massive sort of disruption of what I would consider to be like the cyclical nature to the upside, right? And now you can put that as a bullish thing. You can put that as a bearish thing because if you look at 2020, uh, there was, you know, a similar massive disruption to the upside in January of 2021 when Elon came out and was like, I love Bitcoin. In hindsight, it was inevitable or what would all that kind of stuff. And then the next thing you know, we like skyrocket from, uh, you know, I think we were maybe at like 15K to 32K, uh, or something crazy. And then we march up. You know, two more months by the end of February in, into March, we're looking at 60, 65 K, which is where we topped out. Right. And so, uh, you know, from that perspective, and then uh, like th that last cycle was chaos for a lot of reasons, because then on the back end of it, you had this massive, uh, uh, leverage cycle and, you know, you had FTX that it turns out had like a one point something billion dollar synthetic short on Bitcoin. Like they, they minted an extra billion plus dollars of Bitcoin supply, circulating supply uh, that, you know, they carried on their balance sheet. It's just like all that kind of shit just, you know, yeah. short circuited the market, which is why I think we might be able to go back to a more normal cycle this time around. And you, you could also look at then this March to all time highs that we did before the halving as really more evidence that the all time high of last cycle wasn't meant to be the all time high, you know, like it, it got just distorted by, you know, maybe we were supposed to actually hit a hundred, 150 K, something like that. Uh, and so then we're actually, you know, plenty of ways off the all time high still. So it, I, I, keeping all of that in mind, looking forward of like what's going on in Bitcoin right now and why would I be, you know, so mega bullish on it? Uh, first and foremost, uh, I, let's actually, let's, let's do three buckets. All right. The first bucket is going to be what I would call corporate adoption. And that's one that isn't talked about enough. The, the micro strategy play has played out, uh, tremendously in favor of micro strategy now. Like, you know, they're, they're effectively at the same market cap they were at in the 20 or the 2000 dot com bubble hmm. where like they were one of the, poster child of the dot-com bubble of just like crazy, crazy valuation on the stock. And, uh, and now they're, they're effectively at that level, but the difference is like they have the Bitcoin to back it up. Yeah. And so that's a crazy, like that's an insane outcome for sailor. Uh, and he's outperformed the S and P and basically every other market, uh, in the process. Meta planet in Japan just copied that strategy. They're the best performing stock in Japan this year. Okay, uh, I'm anticipating that you're going to see a microstrategy clone in every major public market by the end of next year. Hmm. And the reason is, is that you can only have the best performing stock in so many markets for so long before everyone's like, well, do I want my stock to perform well or not? You know, and so hmm. what's crazy is. Uh, uh, I think I was, so, so one thing, let's, let's go back to MicroStrategy. Let's say MicroStrategy gets into the S&P 
the cutoff for market cap to get in the S and P is I think fifteen bill, and they're sitting at like thirty bill or twenty five bill right now market cap. So they're past that threshold. Uh, there's a couple of more considerations in terms of like you know how much is the stock uh, uh, diluted, you know how much is owned by Sailor versus how much is owned by the market, and then uh, uh, the other one is like profitability quarter over quarter, which I think you know they're within that sort of threshold. So like at any point they could basically be in, inducted into the S and P at a twenty five billion market cap. Uh, I was talking to some some analysts, and they said that that would roughly equate to ten billion dollars in passive flows going into MicroStrategy effectively overnight. And mm-hmm. what that is is that's like S and P index funds yeah. that uh, you know your vanguards, etc., that just allocate to the S and P at a pro rata amount based on where it is in the ranking of the S and P. Uh, and so the thing is, is $10 billion flowing into MicroStrategy effectively means $10 billion flowing into Bitcoin because they'll immediately use, you know, the, uh, premium on the stock to go buy more Bitcoin. Uh, we've had, I think roughly 11 or, okay. When we went from the crazy ETF run up, that was $11 billion in inflows to Bitcoin. So you're talking about effectively the entire equivalent of all the ETF launch from the beginning of this year, uh, just from MicroStrategy listing into the S&P in terms of buy pressure to Bitcoin. And that took us from 20K to 69K. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's say that that takes us to roughly 100K. Well, that then affects the MicroStrategy stock price. And so then MicroStrategy climbs up the ranking of the S&P. Uh, and these analysts told me that basically every billion dollars in market cap to MicroStrategy means like 300, 200 million dollars in, uh, flows back to the stock from these passive funds. And so that's then 200 million dollars that flows back to Bitcoin, uh, by them purchasing more Bitcoin. And you create this flywheel effect very quickly, uh, where just MicroStrategy alone could have a massive impact on the Bitcoin price. As soon as it gets into the S and P, all right. Now, put that across every other capital market, and it's not going to take long for every other company to the S and P to be like, "Well, shit, we got to get some of this Bitcoin," you know, because MicroStrategy is passing us in the rankings; they're flying right by us, uh, and all they're doing is buying Bitcoin. Like, we should be buying Bitcoin. Uh, and some of these companies have massive treasuries, you know, yeah. uh, 60 billion dollars in cash that they're sitting on in these different places. And so you could see a crazy flywheel effect where just the corporate adoption alone could send us to 350k easily, right? Then you add in uh, uh these other two buckets, one being your uh nation state adoption, right? Uh uh seeing um El Salvador and their success, seeing the Kingdom of Bhutan and their success, seeing uh, uh, you know, there are countries in the Middle East that I'm not allowed to talk about yet that, uh, their central banks are buying Bitcoin. Hmm. And if a Trump gets in office and we have a national stockpile, that could very quickly become a Bitcoin purchasing, uh, program as well. So, you know, and once the U.S. does it, every, com- every country is going to have their own strategic, uh, Bitcoin stockpile, right? So, that's a trend that could take off very quickly in January of next year uh, or sooner. And um, that's a massive tailwind. And, and, you know, they play with trillions of dollars, you know, that, that we're talking about in inflows, which would be effectively the like multiples of the entire market cap of Bitcoin right now uh, flowing yeah. into Bitcoin. So, you know, that's a major thing. And then the last thing is just like general adoption, people being more comfortable with it. People putting their own investment, you know, retirement portfolios into Bitcoin or Bitcoin derivative, you know, assets. People, you know, once you have BlackRock, the U.S. government and and multiple governments around the world all buying Bitcoin, it makes it a lot less risky for you to feel like you can, you know, diversify more of your net worth into Bitcoin. Uh, and so then you have like unlocked, who knows, hundreds of billions of dollars flowing into Bitcoin that way too. So. All of those trends could happen realistically in the next 18 months. Mm. And that could put us at massive Bitcoin prices uh, in a very short amount of time. 
especially considering there's just not that much Bitcoin circulating right now. I think, you know, estimates say that there's maybe two to three million Bitcoin that are like available to, for purchase on the market right now, period. Yeah. It's, you know, it just, it, it gets into moon math numbers the more you think about it. So that's where I'm coming from on, on some of the crazy numbers. And I, I truly don't think that they're that crazy when you look at the full picture of what's going on right now. Every, uh, every down cycle, <laughs> you see people come out and say, it's going to zero. It's going to zero. And I always laugh because I'm like, I think you just need to learn how to zoom out of that chart a little bit to really see that it's not going to zero. At least not anytime soon. With uh, with individual investors, do you feel like the the influx of institutional money kind of hurts uh, individual investors who are not quite in the space yet? Like, does it detract from them joining, or is it all the more reason to? You know, I would say uh, we've had 15 years to front run Wall Street. And uh, like that's that's the only head start we're going to get. So, I, you know, the people who didn't get into Bitcoin already, the vast majority of them, especially in the United States, they've heard of Bitcoin now. You know, mm-hmm. like they kind of there was an active choice made whether or not they were going to spend the time to learn about it and, and invest in it and, and care about it. And, you know, now the guys in suits uh, have figured it out and, and are investing in it in a meaningful way. So I, I don't think it hurts. I don't think it helps. You know, I, I think it helps, you know, like I ultimately, I think everything is good for Bitcoin, but like uh, it, it's just one of those things where it's kind of, it almost feels like pearl clutching at this point of, you know, like what about the individuals? It's like, this is the free market baby. And the free market is, is the biggest sort of like wild west there is. And, uh, if you didn't get in yet, like, you know, that's, that's your fault. So I don't know, like it's, it's a little bit of a maybe blase take on it, but, um, but I just, I'm, I'm strapped in, you know, like I, I see this going only one way and it's, it's up and to the right. Yeah. Um, are there situations that you can see in the future, uh, that could hurt Bitcoin? I mean, we have, first of all, the presidential election and the way Congress is going to go is kind of up in the air. Uh, we know Democrats are a little bit more hostile toward, or maybe a lot more hostile toward Bitcoin and crypto. And it's possible that Kamala Harris gets into the White House or stays in the White House. Uh, it's possible that we have a Democrat majority in either the House, Senate, or both. Uh, we have looming World War III, potentially. We, I mean, for all we know, we could be in World War III and just not know it until we look back 20 years later. And then, uh, are things like Tether uh, a concern to you? Like people suspect that Tether is not being accurate with its books and, and printing Tether that's not really backed. Does, that, does any of that really concern you as far as what's going to happen to Bitcoin in the future? Uh, I think that they're all valid concerns. Um, I, like I guess I would make a sport out of kind of uh, pairing with each of them of, of, you know, what a counterpoint to them would be. Um, but, but certainly, you know, like uh, uh, Bitcoin's chart has been anything but like a straight line, you know, it, it goes up, it goes down. What I will say is none of those uh, fundamentally change the reality of Bitcoin uh, or the trajectory of Bitcoin. So they could add chaos in the short term. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, I do think, well, I, I go back and forth in terms of like whether Kamala uh, would cause the market to tank or not. Um, I actually, I kind of think maybe the market would pump on it uh, because I think that like one of the major overhangs on the Bitcoin price right now is actually just the uncertainty of it. It's just like we don't know who the president's going to be. Therefore, we're not going out on the risk curve and Bitcoin is viewed as going out on the risk curve in this moment. Yeah. So 
But like, you know, even if we were going to get some extreme form of, of Kamala banning Bitcoin in the United States, first of all, she'd have to do that to BlackRock, who wouldn't be very happy. Uh, and I, I would be very surprised, you know, BlackRock and Fidelity and JP Morgan now are going to have a word before she gets to go ban Bitcoin in the United States. So seems unlikely. Um, but certainly, you know, you could have like a, a negative attitude towards it. Uh, I will say that like I, one major trend that I expect is if, if the Democrats win, uh, in November, then the majority of the market will move to Dubai over the next four years. Hmm. Um, and Dubai, I think, will thereby emerge as like the global financial hub. And it's really bullish for them. Like, kudos. And, and I think that that will actually be then a further, uh, like you said, 20 years from now, looking back, are we in World War III? That will be a narrative of World War III is Dubai's emergence as the Switzerland, the financial, like it's, it'll be like a Switzerland meets London style, uh, meets New York style emergence of, of that market because of the, uh, like ironically, there's something to, to go back to our beginning of our conversation about like, uh, Trump is this centralized figure, but he like leads to very decentralized market sort of, uh, 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 growth. That's a very similar structure to what's happening in the UAE right now. There's, there's kind of this NBZ character. He's, you know, a king. He's a sheikh. He's, uh, you know, his excellency. Uh, and yet it's the most free market system that exists in the world right now. Uh, from what I can tell, you know, like from, from my digging and I've, I've talked to people over there. I've, I've learned a lot. We got a conference in Abu Dhabi later this year. It is very capitalist over there. And so in a world where all of these other places are kind of going down a wartime mentality, you know, pseudo fascist, like, uh, or, or Marxist sees the means of production, sees the economy pointed all, to, all towards war. Uh, the one place that's going to completely opt out of that war is going to be the UAE and, uh, and money and talent and, uh, intellect is just going to pour into that country. So I, I think that, and the UAE is very positive towards Bitcoin. So like, uh, it'll, it'll just be positive, you know, instead of the U S taking the lead on Bitcoin, which it has for, I would say like the past six years, uh, it used to be China, you know, uh, the U S was not the, the focal point of the Bitcoin industry. When I first joined the industry, uh, it'll just move again and and that's fine. Yeah, China kind of shot itself in the foot by taking the anti-crypto stance and having all the miners move out, move out of China in a way. Uh, they could have, they had the opportunity to be the leader in the industry, but, you know, that authoritarian control was threatened. It's not even the opportunity. They were the leader. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, us running a media company in the United States, we had an office in Shanghai. And the reason was is that most of the news and activity was happening in China and we had to know what was going on there. We had to build the relationships with the companies there. Bitmain was there. Uh, uh, you know, these massive exchanges, OKCoin, uh, uh, et cetera, Binance, you know, was based out of Hong Kong. Like that was where the action was. And then, you know, they banned it and it moved and most of it moved to the U S. And so, it, you know, they, they did shoot themselves in the foot and, uh, and there are people in the government who recognize that now which is also a very interesting trend. So, you know, the news today was that the People's Bank, uh, uh, I think either Xi or the People's Bank of China, one of the two, had just green-lighted using the PBOC uh, in order to buy stock. Uh, they, they said basically, like, funds, insurers, and, like, uh, uh, something else can use the PBOC's money to go buy stocks. So they're basically just like, Hey, we're just going to like print money and prop up the stock market. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, they're, they're going through a reckoning right now. And, uh, I, I've got a feeling that in that chaotic outcome, they will reverse their stance on Bitcoin very quickly. Uh, one of my biggest stances is I'm anti-war and I'm very much against the central banking system, the fed printing money 
and I've made this point before, I, I believe that the ability to print money, and G. Edward Griffin makes this point really well in his uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island book. If you allow a government to just print money from nothing and just basically tax you through inflation, you give them free reign to declare war and charge you for it after the fact. Uh, whereas if if they had to rely on something like Bitcoin or gold or something that's has some limitation on it, they couldn't just declare war because they have to pay for it somehow. And uh, exactly. if they actually had to tax people for it, it would be very unpopular. Like all the wars that we've had to, that we've been thrown into in the U.S. over the last 30, 40, 50 years, all of those would not have the support they did if people actually had to pay for it up front. Um, so I think it's one of the best, one of the, one great argument for Bitcoin is just the fact that you're, you're putting your money in a place where the government just can't just use it for these endless wars. What are some of the other, or you can elaborate on that and offer any of the other really big reasons that people should be considering Bitcoin if they haven't already? Yeah, no, I, I I agree wholeheartedly with the, the anti-war stance. I, I will say that uh, recent events have made me less optimistic that uh, even on a Bitcoin standard that there will be no war. Um, I, you know, I think that we've been privileged to live through a period of time where there wasn't much global conflict, like except for our forever wars in the Middle East, which I would put into a different bucket, right? Like uh, those were just fiat inflation wars. Yeah. But I, I get the feeling more and more that there is this like conflict is inevitable and that it's almost, uh, it is, it is begotten out of uh, hard times. Or, or like a down market almost where it's like there's if we're not growing we're shrinking and when we're shrinking the pie is shrinking and it matters your size of the pie and therefore it matters the other person's size of the pie and then you know in order to keep your amount of pie the same size you got to go steal his and, and there's like that's there's just like this element of it that'll never go away mm -hmm. uh and and so and you know the unfortunate reality of a bitcoin system is that you don't get to print money to make it look like you're growing every year. We're not going to grow every year. That's, that's not how anything works. You know, like, uh, we just print money to make it look like we're growing every year so that, uh, mm -hmm. uh everyone's happy. So that being said, I, I, and where I agree wholeheartedly is that Bitcoin is accountability. It's accountability to the power structures. It means that they don't get to decide that you're going to war without people agreeing to it. Uh, and, and that's a massive win because it requires a rationale and requires a, um, a shared culpability of war that makes it a lot more real. It makes it a lot more, um, I don't know, almost important in everyone's lives. Whereas, you know, in the past 20 years and our forever wars in the Middle East, you know, how many Americans every day woke up and thought about, you know, who we drone sh struck that day. Right. Yeah. Not many, but if, if we were kind of actively voting every year to continue it, uh, and this is what it's going to cost you. And this is how much you're going to pay in taxes this year in order to pay for it. Then not only does it, uh, raise the barrier to continue it, but it also puts you in a little bit of a seat where you are specifically pressing the button to continue it, you know, like, uh, and, and so it, it just makes it more real for people. I think that's important. You know, I think that like, there are a few things, you know, to, to broaden the, the scope a little bit and talk, you know, philosophically, there are few crueler things you can do to a man than to separate him from his consequences or like the consequences of his actions and that uh, it allows pe it allows true evil to uh, exist. And, you know, the, a simple example of this being like the Holocaust and Nazis, right? You know, it's a tropey thing to talk about, but might as well. 
you had all the stories of like, you know, how were they killing Jews? Well, first they were doing the firing squads and then it weighed so heavily on the, the soldiers that had to go shoot people that they had to stop doing it and they had to resort to these other methods that put a little bit of separation between the two of them so that these people weren't directly culpable, uh, uh, you know, how they were kind of committing these atrocities. And, you know, you look at drone strikes nowadays and it's like, you know, it's someone sitting half a world away watching a screen and pressing a button. Yeah. That's a lot different from, you know, someone directly pulling a trigger and looking at someone in the eyes. And so, you know, that's like this trend that dehumanizes us. And it takes away some aspect of like our, our humanity, uh, and the capital H sense. And so, yeah, like I don't know exactly where I'm going with that, except to say that it, it coincides really strongly with my own belief of anti-war and that the best way that you can, you know, avoid war is to bring that direct interaction back to the equation. Uh, and I think Bitcoin helps in that process. Yeah, I agree. I think the the Fed, the ability to print money is exactly what you're saying. It's There's no accountability there. There's no, the people who are printing and the people that are benefiting from the printing, they don't see in real time the consequences of what they're doing. Everyone gets poor, but it's not right now they're poor. It's just for indefinitely into the future. And increasingly so that people are poor and have less ability to do anything with their money because their share of the pot gets diluted every single, I mean, every second of every day, essentially. But over time, it just, it increases and increases. And yeah, there's just no accountability for it. So I, I, I'm on board with that. Do you think, uh, I know one of the things that you want to see is uh, the value, uh, the market cap of Bitcoin reach the market cap of gold. Do you ultimately want to see Bitcoin as a reserve currency for the U.S. rather than us relying on $36 trillion of debt of uh, monopoly money? Do you want to see that as the reserve currency? Yeah, and, and it's not really even like what I want. I think we're just going to see it happen. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it, it's like it's an inevitability. And, you know, I will say to, again, wax a little poetic, uh, one of my biggest lessons over the past year, uh, let's say 12 months, like not 2024 directly, is people in Bitcoin like to talk about these inevitabilities. And then uh, we don't give enough appreciation and respect to, you know, the path by which those inevitabilities occur. And um, and it's it's less inevitable than it seems. You know, like you can be very far away from it and you can just be like, Oh, this is going to happen. And, and then, you know, a, a year later, you'd be like, see, I told you this was going to happen. And then they, they don't understand what went into making that happen. And it feels very not inevitable for the people who do. And, and so, you know, like obviously uh, an example of this and that's top of my mind is like Trump speaking at the Bitcoin conference, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they're, I got so many people who were like, oh, I knew Trump would speak at the Bitcoin conference. Uh, you know, I called it four years ago that he was going to speak at this Bitcoin, you know, like uh, yeah. he's going to be pro Bitcoin, all this kind of stuff. And it's like, bro, we spent months educating him, his team, you know, talking through the importance of it, talking through why voters will care about it, talk, you know, like all of it. It's like nothing about this was inevitable. And yeah. if we didn't do it, no one would have done it. Uh, and so, you know, when I, when I look at the, uh, it'll inevitably, uh, be a reserve currency. It will, but I am also appreciative of the fact, like it's going to take some battles. It's going to like, you know, there are going to be heroes who will be the people remembered as the folks who made this happen and, you know, uh, brought Bitcoin into the, the U S reserve. Like it, so, so I don't want to belittle that, but I do think it's inevitability that, that it will end up happening. Awesome. Um, with, with it being a reserve currency eventually, can you, well, first of all, we, you touched on this a little bit, but growth, we're, we're an economy that is focused on growth all the time. And I think the big reason for that is the Fed printing money. You have to keep up with inflation. So you have to have, you know, 5% growth on an average year 
just to keep up with that inflation. Do you see growth not being as important a factor when we have Bitcoin as a reserve currency? Or how does that actually look? Because it's hard to step outside of the reality that you're in and see a reality that is going to be very different and uh, just, yeah, completely different than the reality that we we're currently living in. The system that we're living in is built around this pyramid scheme of printing money. So how does this actually look like? What does it look like when people want to, like if people are getting paid in something backed by Bitcoin and things like that, like how does this all look when it's a reserve currency? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's a good question. It's it's one of those things where uh, you could ask 10 people and you get 10 different answers, right? What I, what I will say is, uh, you know, I think we're going to need to redefine what growth means. Uh, and, and I, like, I do believe that maybe we also want to question whether growth is the goal. Uh, and that's not to say that, like, I have this pessimistic view on the future of humanity. It's actually a very optimistic view. Uh, but it is to say that, you know, uh, I think it's Eric Weinstein has this kind of like good riff on these embedded growth obligations in all these different institutions. And that then that's really what their downfall was because then they all eventually became, you know, he doesn't directly say this, but like they all eventually became fiat inflationary like uh, uh, institutions, right? Yeah. Uh, and we got to remove those embedded growth obligations and like celebrate growth where it exists. But growth uh, from like my standpoint would be growth of the human lifespan and growth of like the population and growth of, you know, uh, uh, the uh, space faring nature of humanity and like, you know, all of these, all of these things that like we should truly be aspiring to uh, and not just that, like our stock prices are going up. Like that's not growth. Uh, uh, it can be, but in, in the way that it exists right now, it's just debasement. And so, uh, you know, part of what growth should be is actually the reduction in prices because it's the growth of the purchasing power of your money. And so, you know, like one, one group would call that actually degrowth. Uh, and the other group would call that growth, right? But but I would call it growth. You know, it's everyone's getting richer. Uh, but the way by which that's happening is that the price of everything is decreasing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, like it, it's it's a little funky in that way. And, and then, you know, if you want to talk through like how it all happens, I think that – I think it looks like a lot of different ways. I would say in my, in my least idealistic like or ideological, my most pragmatic sense – I think what happens is that Bitcoin is used as gold and that, you know, there is still a U.S. dollar and that that U.S. dollar is derived from gold, you know, digital gold. And uh, that that conversion rate is locked in. That and or, you know, and, and potentially manipulated. Uh, and, you know, eventually you get the same sort of fiat tendency where we ultimately break away from the Bitcoin price of the dollar, you know, and then it floats again. And then we become another fiat economy. And then, you know, you go through another inflationary stage. And then, you know, either the currency collapses and a new currency is formed or the currency repegs to the, you know, Bitcoin at a different price. You know, like, and, but the, the difference is, uh, between going forward and, and every other time in the past is that there is a democratized access to Bitcoin. And so the people, will be able to make a choice of whether they want to hold their value in the dollars or whether they want to hold the value in Bitcoin underlying. And the Bitcoin underlying cannot be manipulated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's this like element where unlike prior times, you know, the, what is it? Order uh, uh, 3102 or uh, uh, no, 6102, right? 2016 backwards. Um, the, where, where FDR seized everyone's gold, right? And then doubled the price overnight after he, after he seized it all and made it illegal to own it. Like that is way less feasible with Bitcoin. Yeah. Because you, you don't really know how much someone owns. It's very easy to hide it. It's very easy to, uh, it's very hard to confiscate it. You know, uh, you got to 
control the private key. Like it's, it's not going to happen that way. And, uh, if it did happen, it would be so easy nowadays for people to move. You know, mm-hmm. it's like if 6102 happened tomorrow, how many people are going to El Salvador? How many people are going to Dubai? And they don't, they don't need to pack a bunch of gold bars in their suitcase. They need 12 words in their mind and they're, they're out, you know? So it's just, it's a different reality for humanity, which is a very good one. It's a very humanistic reality. Yeah. Um, my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, housing prices, for instance, like it, you see it go up in uh, relative to the dollar. You see housing prices go up uh, in dollar value. But if you adjust for inflation, they're pretty much stagnating. Um, they're, they're not really going up as much as people think. Uh, gold, if you bought a house, uh, you could buy the same house, you know, 60 years apart for roughly the same amount of gold. But then when you look at Bitcoin, the price in Bitcoin for a home goes down. It's less Bitcoin every cycle. Uh, I think that's a reality that is hard for people who live, I mean, all of us live in this economy. I think that's something that's really hard for people to wrap their heads around the idea that in the future, or even now, I guess, you could have a certain amount of Bitcoin, sit on it, and rather than trying to earn enough money and keep up with inflation and all this kind of stuff, where not only do you have to save your money, you have to have it earning enough interest to make up for the inflation that you would be losing on that money if it just sat there. The reality where you could be, okay, I have a half a Bitcoin and it's not enough to buy a house right now. All I really have to do is find enough, uh, find a way to earn money to live off of without touching that half a Bitcoin. And then, then in eight years or 10 years, I might be able to just buy a house with the Bitcoin that I haven't touched. I think that's a reality that's really hard for people to wrap their, their heads around, including myself. Yeah, no. Well, and, and I think that there's like an element where, uh, Right now, so so look at the inputs of let's say real estate. You know, it's actually really simple if you like zoom out wide enough and you kind of like draw a massive box around it. It's like what's the input? What's the output? The output is the the price of the house. The input is the number of people and the uh, uh you know the underlying money by which you're buying it, right? And and you know there's true scarcity with land. You know, ignoring for like apartments and, and that kind of shit, like. There's never going to be more land. There's never going to be more Bitcoin. And so, uh, you know, like those two are constant. But the, so, you know, to your point, or I guess like where I'm going to uh, disagree or agree to disagree a little bit is that like, I don't think forever the price of houses are going to go down in Bitcoin terms hmm. uh, necessarily. I think that eventually it will level off to a, a similar extent to gold. Now, I don't think that like, I don't think it's going to happen necessarily anytime soon. And I think that the, the reason is, is that there's going to continue to be this like distribution process of Bitcoin to the rest of the world. And, and that's just going to like, that's the monetization process of Bitcoin. But eventually that will kind of stop in Bitcoin. We will reach what I would call like hyper Bitcoinization, in which case the, the really the only thing that changes the price of a house is the number of people that are looking to buy a house. And so, you know, like that's the, the thing that's going to change a lot. And, uh, you could see where sitting on your Bitcoin, maybe, uh, uh, you know, the value of a house goes down in Bitcoin terms because, uh, uh, you know, there are a few people looking for houses and, you know, the market has just gone down. Or on the flip side, uh, you could see just a ton of economic activity and, uh, the value of that Bitcoin kind of grows that way because there's just been mass, you know, some breakthrough in technology, free energy has been invented. And, you know, like now, now, you know, things are so, uh, uh, Bitcoin so valuable because it's, it's scarce and can buy so much that, you know, now a house is cheaper and you can go build a million houses, even though the real estate's rare, you know, like, uh, uh, you can build, build a lot more houses easily. So like it's, it's a complicated sort of hypothetical, I guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but, um, yeah, like it's, uh, I don't, I don't know necessarily that you'll just be able to sit on your Bitcoin and that real estate will be falling against Bitcoin forever. Like both of those two things are ultimately like pretty scarce, hmm. but Bitcoin is scarcer. So like, you know, that, that'd be my hedge. Yeah. Well, I mean, with, 
with gold. I mean, I know Bitcoin is often looked at as digital gold, and I see it that way. But it, it has its big differences too, in that gold, while the price of a house in gold might be consistent, there's also like new mines constantly being discovered for that gold. Whereas Bitcoin, it's like we know exactly how much Bitcoin there is. And on yeah. top of that, not only is not uh, more not get, getting created, some gets lost every year. So, uh, like small transactions of it uh, get left somewhere that don't get touched again. So there's there's a certain amount of Bitcoin that's lost every year. So it it seems different than gold in that respect, doesn't it? Totally, yeah. And and that's a, it's a key difference. Is like, and, and again, you would probably. Uh, because of the aspect of the gold supply, that's why I would say houses haven't changed in the price of gold over the past 60 years. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I would expect that the prices of houses would actually have gone down in gold terms as well. So like that, that's kind of what I didn't say, but I was thinking when I was kind of rambling. And so, but it is a key distinction. Like we don't know how much gold there is. We can't audit the supply. Uh, mm-hmm. and we don't know how much gold there is left to go get. Uh, and certainly there's kind of infinite le- left to go get because there's gold and asteroids and, you know, all the, all the stuff that crazy people like to talk about. So yeah, like whereas Bitcoin, there are only ever going to be 21 million and yeah, the circulating supply is going to shrink year over year due to some amount that gets lost, uh, as well as, uh, you know, dusting of, of wallets where, you know, you have a amount in this UTXO over here that's just not greater than the fee that it would take to move it. So. Yeah, like the, those are all absolutely trends um, and and interesting trends, but um, it doesn't change in my mind kind of the fundamental comparison of like Bitcoin as digital gold. I still think that's like the most useful metaphor out there. So you know, it, it shortcuts a lot of having to explain things. If you can just yeah. say like, "All right, digital gold," you know, let's move on. Yeah. Are there other cryptos that you're bullish on? Not really. Uh, you know, I, I think that, um, something that's not talked enough about in the crypto world, maybe they're talking about it a lot more now with sort of the, uh, the death thralls of Ethereum, uh, is that there's like not that much digital scarcity that we've found a way to make valuable, you know, mm-hmm. and, and there's this challenge in, Cryptography, I guess, it, it, like the, the sort of the cypherpunk underpinnings of Bitcoin. Uh, there was something that's not talked enough about. Everyone talks about Byzantine general problem. Not enough people talk about the Oracle problem. Um, and that problem is how do you know that an event happened in physical space that you can record in digital space? And so this is why, like, I always laugh at Chainlink. You know, Chainlink's found a lot of success, but Chainlink claims to have solved the Oracle problem. That's like, uh, you know, that's like claiming to have solved the, you know, God paradox. Uh, yeah. you know, like, can God create a stone too heavy for him to lift? It's like, you know, I've solved the problem. It's like, the point of the problem is you can't solve it, you know, like, yeah. uh, uh, and so there's this element where, you know, what all is, what all units of value are going to be digitized? Everyone loves to talk about, uh, Stocks, you know, like uh, real world assets of stocks, right? And someday Ethereum is going to have, or Solana is going to have, like all these stocks trading on that platform. Well, how do you know that that stock actually correlates to the, uh, you know, company that you think it does? Like you just bought one Apple share on Solana. How do you know that there is a corresponding share in that company? that one to one matches the apple share that you just bought you you would have to go look at something right like uh and the way that we currently have it is we have an sec all right uh that that kind of regulates and enforces that you're not creating fake shares so now you have a centralized authority that regulates the entire market so why are you using a decentralized blockchain to trade the uh the stock when every trade has to be compliant with the centralized regulator, you know, like it, it, you could just have a centralized, uh, blockchain, you know, it's not even a blockchain, a centralized ledger exchange 
uh, that's just directly regulated by the SEC. And then you don't have to pay these crazy data fees and storage fees of a blockchain, you know, like, uh, and so like that's kind of the, the reductive challenge of all these other cryptos is like they're trying to solve problems, but they can't get around the Oracle problem. And, you know, y- y- the, the interesting point to make against that is like, well, what about Bitcoin? You know, what Oracle problem did Bitcoin solve? And then that's where you kind of talk about Bitcoin mining. And, you know, you could say that what Bitcoin mining did is it solved the problem of energy was expended to create this block. Hmm. Uh, and by creating basically a perfect proof of work system that confirms that, then you have this this linchpin of the entire system now like uh, unwinds and explodes out of that fact. And, and so like, yeah, it's, it's like, it works in that one scenario because energy being expended is electricity generated, which is the translation of physical chemical, you know, name your type of physical energy over here into electrons moving, which is data, right? You know, it's like this, that is the pure translation. And so like, that's the one Oracle problem you can solve is like one, you know, or zero. It's like this happened, but everything else is an abstraction on top of that. And therefore like requires some sort of Oracle that can tell you whether or not what you're looking at truly happened. And so, you know, uh, I'll give one more example because maybe this is not that interesting, but I, I find it interesting. It's like there was a, this is like the perfect example. There was a crypto that was launched in 2017 or something like that. That was like sweat coin. And it was the idea of incentivizing people to work out and be physical. And if you did 10 push ups, you would be awarded one sweat coin. All right. Fascinating idea. And so then it's like, well, how do you, prove that you did the 10 pushups. Ah, well, that's the question, right? So they had this solution of, you know, record a video of you doing 10 pushups and submit it here and we'll give you the sweat coin. But then it's like, okay, well, this guy, it looked like he was doing half pushups. Do we still count that? You know, like, uh, uh, who decides, uh, this person, you know, this, this video looks the exact same of the last video you submitted, except maybe you just like distorted it with some quick like video editor. You know, is that the say who decides, right? And so then you have this oracle of like, did these push-ups actually occur? And how do you prove that? Uh, And and so, you know, that's going to be the fundamental problem that plagues the rest of crypto for the end of time, in my opinion. And uh, and for that reason, you know, I think that Bitcoin's just special. Makes sense. Uh, First of all, before I ask about uh, the next conference, with uh, you had Secret Service at this one. Was this the first time that you've had Secret Service at a conference, and w- did that raise some challenges that you weren't expecting? So many challenges. It was an absolute nightmare. Uh, uh, and you know, like I, I think it degraded the event a little bit having all the Secret Service there. It was cool, uh, but it meant that like going, we showed up on Monday, and the event started on Thursday. And on Monday, they came in and they were like, all right, we've done our walkthrough of the building. Uh, you need to close this door, this door, this door. You need to lock this door. You need to close the air wall here. And it was like, they just came in and completely wrecked our entire floor mm. plan, yeah. uh, the entire attendee flow. And we had to rebuild it from scratch yeah. with these massive TSA checkpoints. Every time someone walked through a door that could get them into the main stage where Trump was speaking. And we're RFK. I mean, we had to do this for RFK too because he got awarded uh, Secret Service the week before our event yeah. because of the the Trump assassination attempt that yeah. like also freaked us out and wondered if we like just lost Trump as a speaker. Right? You know, like uh, it was chaos, man. It was chaos. And so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, working with the Secret Service is a massive challenge, and it's not one you can entirely prepare for because. You know, they're doing a million events and your event comes up in their flow when it comes up in their flow. And that's usually the week of, and you just got to roll with the punches and you can't go overrule 
the Secret Service, you yeah. know, when it comes to the security of the president. Like, you, you don't get to do that. So you're really at the whims of them. So it, it was a challenge for sure. Uh, do you have, uh, what do you have coming up for the next one? Do you have the location already set? And uh, are you going to try to make it even bigger? Like, I mean, how do you top having a former president there? I doubt you would get a, whoever the president is, I doubt they'd have much incentive to come next year because it's not an election year. Uh, but maybe, you know, like, how do you, I mean, you always want to do better, right? Like, how do you one up that? How do you make that better? Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, the question that we're asking ourselves of like, where do we go from here? Um, I think that there's a few different directions to, to really improve on what we did last year. Uh, number one is that let's say we reached the pinnacle of U.S. politics. All right. You know, getting presidential candidates in election years, you can't do much better than that. Uh, I do think, you know, we would try and shoot our shot of getting whoever the president is, uh, to the event, but less sure of a thing to your point because they're not campaigning. Uh, maybe they do or don't want to show up at a random event. The, that being said, number one, there are going to be world leaders who are paying attention, especially if Trump's president, like, uh, uh, it, it opens up some doors for us to be able to try and, you know, pull in world leaders to talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. And so, uh, we'll, we'll pursue that as much as we can and see who we can bring in. And there's certainly, you know, people that we've been talking to on the fringes, uh, that, that could be interesting. And I think that there's a lot more cultural, uh, elements that, that we haven't really picked apart yet, uh, and that we haven't really doubled down on yet. Vegas is where we're going. It's, it's a cultural hotbed. There's tons of talented artists there. There's tons of musicians. There's tons of crazy people, to be frank. Uh, you know, so, so there's just like, it's a, it's a new environment for us to try and cast into and, and see, you know, what Bitcoiners we can find. Uh, a funny example is like, uh, when we announced Vegas, uh, we actually got a DM from Caitlyn Jenner, uh, who I think at the time had just launched a shitcoin on Solana, like a meme coin of herself. And so, you know, th there are reasons why, why she was reaching out, but yeah, like she's like, I want to be there. I live in Vegas. You know, I'm so excited to, to support me. She lives in LA or something like that, but she, she asked to speak, right? So you, you, you never know like where these new markets are going to go. And then uh, I also think that there's a massive opportunity to the earlier point of, uh, you know, corporate adoption being a major trend for the next 18 months uh, of getting more business leaders to the event that aren't in Bitcoin. You know, it's a, it's a frustrating thing for me that we can't seem to get the uh, Mark Zuckerbergs or the uh, Elons or the, you know, major tech CEOs, major Fortune 500 CEOs to come talk about like what Bitcoin means to a corporation and how they view it and the standpoint of protecting its inflation and all these things, right? And so uh, I think that that's a massive growth opportunity for us as well. And Vegas is a place that they're all very comfortable and familiar with traveling for sort of business conferences. So we'll see how we can we continue to build it. And uh, certainly 2024 will have its place in the history books. And, you know, trying to replicate what we did in 2024 is a, is a failing, uh, initiative. Just like in 2021, when we had the president of El Salvador announce legal tender, you know, trying to go get another president to announce legal tender in 2022. That's a, you know, it's a crazy mission to try and set out on. So yeah. each, each one creates their own environment, creates their own topics, creates their own buzz. Uh, and we just got to lean into the sort of authentic narratives that emerge. Awesome. I love to ask people about books that uh, have influenced them. Do you have any books that you recommend that could be Bitcoin related or just life related? Um, you know, I'm not the most well-read person out there. Uh, it's it's something where a lot of the books I read are like biographies. I'm a big fan of uh, 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 see, I'm I'm even blanking on his name, uh, Walter Isaacson. So I've, I've read almost every Walter Isaacson biography. I think that he does a fantastic job of like breaking down these interesting characters of history. Uh, if I were to give one book, again, this is probably cheesy and, and your audience has probably all read it already, but I think like The Alchemist is a great one um, where it's, it's a very simple read. It's a very quick read. The points it makes are somewhat childish in terms of their simplicity. And yet there's like a, a power to that 
where sometimes, you know, uh, uh, realizing where you are on your own journey is, is a very simple task when you just break it down into like, Hey, you know, you're on a journey, you have challenges, but your journey is a hero's journey. And you should, you should believe that your journey is a hero's journey and you should treat it as such. And, and, uh, you know, like you should believe in yourself and, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, I feel so cheesy, like just saying it out loud, but, but it ties into uh, what I was saying earlier of, uh, uh, the inevitability of things where like my biggest theme, I've said this to the team, I've said this to David, our CEO, I've said this to other people. It's like, we have the capacity to change the fucking world. And, uh, and we're doing it on an almost daily basis. And that is so cool. And, uh, you know, to hand off the responsibility to someone else and just say like, Oh, this is going to happen. And my saying that it's going to happen is somehow like enough. Uh, it, it allows me to take credit for this thing happening is such a scam that we perpetuate to ourselves. Uh, and, and you have to really open up your, uh, aperture and your expectations of yourself to go do it. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe one more cheesy sort of literary, uh, analogy is, um, and this is what I told the team too. It's, it's Harry Potter in the third book, right? Uh, where, he uh, is at the lake and the Dementors are swirling and he's with Sirius and, you know, they're coming down, they're killing him. And, uh, uh, and he looks across the pond and he sees his dad, you know, uh, basically like produce the spell that chases away all the Dementors. Right. Yeah. And, and then he like collapses and, and falls asleep. Uh, and then, you know, he's like, Oh my gosh, you know, he tells all uh, Hermione and Ron, like my dad stepped in, he saved the day. Like he did it. Uh, you know, it was, it was a special thing. And, and then, you know, the rest of the book goes on and he finds himself, uh, through, you know, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't, <laughs> like he finds himself on the opposite side of the pond. Yeah. And there's this moment where he's waiting for his dad to step out and produce this spell and, and, you know, send away all the Dementors. And he's like, just watch, it's going to happen at any minute. And there's this realization of like, that wasn't my dad. That was me, Hmm. you know? And, and it's, it's the, I think like, you know, the story is this coming of age story. Uh, and it's this moment where he grows up and he's like, no one's going to come in and save me. No one's like, there is no hero outside of me. Like I I don't get to rely on mommy and daddy to come in and fix my problems. I have to go do it. And this is my opportunity. And he steps in and does it, you know, and and it's like, it completes this little time travel arc. And I I just, I, I find myself going back to that more and more as Bitcoin matures as an industry, as we mature as a company, it's just like, we have in our power, in our capacity, the ability to create whatever outcome we want to see in the world and it's on us to do it. And, uh, and that is a empowering idea. Uh, and it's one that we should lean, lean into more. So that's my final statement on it. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. It's been awesome talking to you today. And, uh, before we wrap up, I just want to hand it over to you to tell people where they can find you on social media, where they can learn about the conference, BTC Inc., anything you want to share. Yeah, so you can follow me at Brand BTC on Twitter. I can't say that my takes are any uh, smarter than my Harry Potter, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, callbacks. So uh, maybe I'm worth a follow, maybe not. But uh, uh, certainly, you should check us out at Bitcoin Magazine. You should come to the Bitcoin Conference next year. It literally changes the world every year, and and I'm hoping that next year will be every bit as world changing as 2024. Um, and we do have things in the works to, to make that happen. Some of them I alluded to on the show. And uh, yeah, w- would love to see you. Would love to meet you in person there and, and shake your hand. And uh, you know, all, uh, my DMs are open. If you have any questions, you want to work with us, you want to hit us up, reach out. Excited to chat. Thanks, Brandon. It's been awesome talking to you today. Great to meet you. Great to chat with you. It's been a wonderful couple hours. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. 
It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtm podcast and instagram at thoughtfully mindless thank you for taking the time to listen today until next time stay thoughtfully mindless